Welcome to Tea, the Transgender Experience in Arkansas, a series of conversations with an array of transgender guests. Tea is filmed in the Listening Lab in the studios of KUAF National Public Radio in Fayetteville. I'm your host, Sophia Narani. Today, our guest is scholar Dr. Lisa Corrigan, a professor of communications and director of the Gender Studies Program at the University of Arkansas. We've invited her today to discuss personal pronouns, non-binary pronouns, and neo-pronouns. Thanks for coming to tea, Dr. Corrigan. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. We're so glad to have you. Happy to be here. So, personal pronouns traditionally identify a person by their gender. For example, she has a dog or he has a dog. Non-gendered or non-binary pronouns are not gender-specific and are most often used by people who identify outside of the gender binary. So our first question is, what does it mean when a person identifies as gender neutral or non-binary or gender non-conforming? Well, it generally means that they don't want to or just generally don't identify with the gender expectations of pronouns, right? And so when people say I'm non-binary, they're saying I don't want to live under the cultural expectations that are associated with male and female and they don't want to be referred to all the time necessarily as he or she. I will say, though, that that's something that's in some ways unique to English. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Mandarin, there are no pronouns for he and she. So Mandarin native speakers often have a really hard time, right, with non-binary folks because they don't have he and she pronouns in the language. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it takes them a little bit longer. And there are other languages that don't necessarily gender nouns, right, like his shovel, her home. They don't necessarily have those. So like Hungarian or Estonian or Finnish, there are lots of languages around the world that don't operationalize gender and language the same way that English does. Okay, so it's it's very specific to our, our culture and the English language. Yeah, and romance languages, right? right? So Spanish, French. Right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so they, them is a prime example of a non-binary pronoun. Mm-hmm. For example, she, Sue is a civil rights activist. They are based in Fayetteville. However, that sounds like we are referring to a group of people based in Fayetteville rather than a single individual. And that can cause a lot of confusion and be difficult for some to say without hesitation. Can you provide guidance on best practices for ease of usage of non-binary pronouns, they, them? Sure. Well, first, I just want to say that language is not always clear. So I often don't understand what people are saying because sometimes we need to understand intent. Sometimes we need context clues. Sometimes it's the first time we've heard that piece of information. So I just think that confusion shouldn't be a barrier if the goal is to communicate. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about best practices about pronouns, I think that there are a few. If you don't know, ask, but be discreet. So it's not sensible to ask somebody their pronouns necessarily in a huge group of people that they don't know, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a place where we might want to use our best ethical judgment, right, to find out discreetly what pronouns they prefer. I also think it's sensible to use they or them when you're first getting to know a person until you know what their pronouns are. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You can apologize. But be gracious about it, right? And the person you're speaking with will also be gracious in return. The point is that people want to be seen and understood and they want good faith effort. They don't want to have conflict. The point is not to punish people who make mistakes. It's to genuinely understand where people are coming from. And it seems sensible to me that to use preferred pronouns if you know them when you're introducing people. So for example, my pronouns are she, her. It's in, you know, it's in a bunch of the literature if you look me up. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody's introducing me, they would say, hi, this is Lisa. I want you to meet her. This is where she works. And so it makes sense to me as a good habit to use the preferred pronouns as soon as we know them so we can practice and practice and practice. And I understand that it's not necessarily going to come easily to people, especially if pronouns change over time, but it's really the good faith effort that matters and will be appreciated, I think, by any anyone you're interacting with who might, you know, use non-gender pronouns. Right. So my 
I use non-binary pronouns and she, her Mm -hmm. as well. So I use she, they. And um, like you were mentioning earlier, it has to do with my comfort with Mm -hmm. identifying as a female in our culture and how I don't identify with that on a day-to-day basis. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that's common with a lot of my, on my, my friends, I surround myself with a lot of queer people. So it's, it's common and it's easier to understand for us because we're around it a lot more of the time. Um, Yeah, you have more chance to practice. Yeah, exactly. I think for people who live right in worlds that are strictly controlled by the binary, Mm -hmm. it feels unfamiliar to use they, them in particular, or even to use she and they together. And that's just a learning curve. It's like any other kind of getting to know you information, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I'm thinking about new people and it's like, where did you come from? Where did you grow up? What was, you know, what religion are you? And where did you go to school? And where do you, it's just, you know, biographical information like any other piece. Right. Um, The Trevor Project survey of Mm -hmm. 40,000 LGBTQ youth find that one quarter use non-binary pronouns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're accustomed to it, like you were saying. And data data shows that most non-binary adults identify as queer, bisexual, or asexual Mm -hmm. regarding sexual orientation specifically. But non-binary pronouns are not about sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So do you want to go into explaining that? Yeah, I mean, really, pronouns have no relationship to sexual orientation whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm i thinking a lot about the Kinsey Report, which was the big sex survey that Alfred Kinsey did at the University of Indiana in the 50s, right? And he sent that survey out to a bunch of, quote-unquote, heterosexual households. And that survey came back, and even though the folks in those households used he, his, him, and she, her, hers, they also were having wildly not normative heterosexual sex lives. So there's really no relationship between sexual orientation and pronouns whatsoever for anybody, regardless of how they identify their sexual orientation. Okay. So according to the Williams Institute at UCLA, which researches LGBTQ plus culture and demographics, a small minority of Americans identify as non-binary or gender neutral. Mm -hmm. Yet our American lexicon has radically changed with widespread use of non-binary pronouns by writers, academics, and journalists. Even straight heterosexual professionals and scholars now use their pronouns in their correspondence signatures. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I think it's sensible for all all people to identify their pronouns because this is sort of a transitional period for the language. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you think about language critically, we invent new words, new words get taken up as slang. There are new philosophical concepts or academic terms that get coined. Language is constantly changing. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense that gender language and gendered language would also change. So I, for me, it makes sense that the language language is evolving as people have more freedom to be who they are. And so it's I think it's useful to think about the evolution of language as a fundamental corollary to how much people how many rights people are have to have access to and the kinds of space that they can take up to be fully human. I agree with that. So In addition to non-binary pronouns, we have Mm neo-pronouns. What are they and who uses them? A couple examples that that we've had that we have are Z, Zer, Mm -hmm. and Fay, Fair. Mm -hmm. Do you want to describe those and and their relevance? Well, I think neo-pronouns are useful because they get us totally away from the gender binary. And I think for people who do not identify with male and female as concrete identities of self, it's useful to invent new language that is not connected either phonically or linguistically to the way that gender operates and pronouns in English. So it makes sense to me that that neo-pronouns are becoming a larger part of the lexicon because people need different ways to express themselves. Mm-hmm. 
but they are a lot less common than non-binary pronouns. So well, part of that is because, for, like, think about how many forms we fill out, mm-hmm. right? I just did a bunch today, and I had to p- put my sex, right? right, male or female. And sometimes you get a box for other, and sometimes you get a write-in, fill in the blank. But even in terms of official forms, there is just not enough of an uptake in right thinking through how people self-identify. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I think for a lot of people, even if they're part of the LGBTQ plus community, or especially if they use you know non-gender pronouns, there isn't an opportunity to replicate right. their sense of pronoun and their sense of self in a lot of our public space. So I think that they're less common now, but I anticipate that that changes, you know, in the next 10 years, certainly. Right. So data show that the most trans that most transgender people do not identify mm-hmm. as non-binary. What linguistic trends, if any, are emerging in the trans community when it comes to gender variant pronouns? So that's very interesting because the first national trans survey came out in 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at a conference where those uh, results were announced. And there were over 250 different ways that participants in the national survey identified themselves. And that was in 2012. Right. And so I think that there is just a huge variation in terms of how people perceive themselves as beings and the kind of space that they can occupy when they're asked to actually give their pronouns. So I also just think that there are a ton of pressures, even on people who use non gender pronouns, to conform in some ways. Right. Mm-hmm. So whether that's body or comportment or family or religion or nationality or race, there are pressures that still push people to use some of those gendered pronouns and that's not negligible right I mean I study communication and gender and the data on how early gender pressure begins on people it begins in infancy Mm -hmm. and the preschool studies are fascinating because the way that gender um, norms are produced and enforced on very very young children is profound So some of that's habit, some of it's culture, some of it's violence that enforces, you know, the way that we conform or don't to social norms. Mm -hmm. But as freedom expands, so does does self-expression. Do you have any additional comments, something that you feel like we didn't touch upon? One thing that I think about a lot in terms of people who are new to gender neutral pronouns is the way that they worry and manifest their anxiety about people who don't conform with gender pronouns. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder how many times they've been misgendered, right, as children or as adults, or if they've somebody has yelled a slur at them in a fight, right? People don't want to be misgendered, regardless of their gender or sexual orientation. Uh, This is a sex panic moment, right? There's a lot of concern about sex and sexuality that happens frequently in the U.S., especially at times of political crisis. Mm -hmm. And so queer people very often get scapegoated, and that's what's happening now, and it's happening to LGBTQ plus youth. And so I think that the uproar about pronouns is really about anxiety, about the family, and it's changing status mm. as capital changes, as the na- as the nation changes in response to its relationship to other nations, as immigration changes the population and demographic shifts change. I think that the scapegoating of LGBTQ people, especially as it is articulated around pronouns, is a way that people deal with their anxiety about these changes that they don't feel like they have any control over. I also think that, you know, the psychologists that I work with would say that it's it's displaced envy sometimes towards the youth. I mean, your generation has a lot more flexibility and freedom to exist in the world in, in ways that my generation didn't and that older generations don't. And sometimes I think people um, wish that they had that freedom themselves. I don't think we have a therapeutic culture or a culture of care in the U.S. where people Mm -hmm. can articulate the disappointments and regrets and resentments of living in a culture that's this violent, Mm -hmm. especially for as rich as it is, right? Mm -hmm. Even though we know that that is distributed inequitably, Mm -hmm. I just think that especially 
you know, with the baby boomer generation being the largest generation in the history of the earth, there were a lot of them. Yeah. And they did not get the attention that they needed. Mm -hmm. There's no way that they could have. Right. Because their parents were dealing with this massive war and its aftermath. There were no mental health resources. People didn't have access to education because mm -hmm. really higher education was out of reach for most of the country. And they had no language to talk about who they were or what they wanted. So I think for, you know, for folks who are turning into this programming, it's a real service to think through, you know, what kinds of freedoms we want to secure and make available to future generations. And it's also, I think, a point of reflection, right, about the missed opportunities and unlived lives of so many of our community members. Mm -hmm. And so kudos to you for hosting this program and and for doing this kind of community work. Of course. No, it's this is this is exactly why I came into journalism because I, I felt like it's important to provide a voice to those who don't have it on traditional medias and traditional um, places, you know. So yeah, that's that's really good to hear. You gotta tell your story and you gotta let people tell their stories and that's the importance of public journalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful to be a part of it in whatever small way that I can. Yeah. So I'm glad to meet to you. you on. It was so good to meet you, It's too. really lovely. Yeah, this has been really, really nice. The Transgender Experience in Arkansas is a project of KUAF Public Radio, hosted by me, Sophia Narani, she, they, directed and filmed in the Listening Lab by Emerson Alexander, he, him, produced by reporter and accordionist Jacqueline Frolic, she, her, and conceived by reporter Daniel Carruth, he, him. Financial support for T is provided by generous KUAF listeners. Thank you for supporting your public radio station. You can stream our series at listeninglabkuaf.com.